Community health workers in South Asia have put forward a series of demands for better work conditions. What are these crucial workers seeking? Japan is set to release 1 million metric tons of treated radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant, a move which is controversial domestically and among its neighbors. What are the responses? And UPS workers have voted by a huge margin to approve a contract finalized in July. What does this mean for their protest? This is the Daily Debrief. These are our stories for today. And before you go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. In many countries in South Asia, community health workers play a vital role in last mile health services. In countries with great population density, they are often the professionals who are the face of healthcare for many people. However, they often are not recognized for their work and do not get the necessary benefits. In some cases, they are not even acknowledged as full-time workers. Community health workers from South Asian countries have come together to issue a charter urging the governments and international agencies to respect, protect and promote their rights as workers. The demands have been backed by major international unions and labor rights bodies. We have with us Jyotsna, who is at their conference. So Jyotsna, before we talk about the charter, can you tell us about the work done by these community health workers and why are they so essential to healthcare? Yeah, thanks for inviting Surangya. Um, so firstly, who are community health workers? Community health workers uh, in South Asia are the only women workforce. They are all women. It is not most of them are women. All of them are women. These are the jobs that uh, the governments expect women to do. Um, and they are the frontline health uh, and healthcare workers. Mm, uh, and uh, so in India, they are called Ashas or Anganwadis. Uh, that in uh, Pakistan, for example, there are female uh, community health volunteers. In Nepal, they have a different name. So, so there are different names, but essentially the work they do, which is a lot of work. I mean, the, the list is very long. I can only give a few examples. For example, taking care of the entire maternal and child health uh, uh, um, at a very basic level. So they are the ones on whom the responsibility falls to identify uh, who all are who which who are the women who are pregnant in their constituency in that particular area uh, and once uh, they identify that and it actually involves asking uh, very difficult questions at times it's like keeping a track of periods of women so that if they miss then you tell them that they have to take the pregnancy test and if that comes positive then everything that begins after that so antenatal care and postnatal care ensuring uh, that they go for ultrasounds if required they are connected to the doctors if required taking care of the vaccination once the child is born uh, and ensuring that the vaccination happens identifying cases uh, of, uh, of TB, finding actively uh, if there are cases of TB, identifying diabetes, uh, counseling uh, 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 families about uh, family planning and childhood. And basically, uh, uh, apart from all of this, and then uh, you also have these uh, special weeks and days, right, that the government uh, does, which are campaigns for, say, nutrition or for vaccination. So they are the ones who go door to door uh, talking about it or asking people to come to uh, primary health care centers and do it. Uh, and we have been attending this uh, you know, community health workers conference in uh, Kathmandu in Nepal. And I can just tell you a couple of, of stories which you hear and you are like, wow, <laughs> how can one person do this? Um, so most of them uh, have to cover up to 10, uh, 10 to 20 houses uh, every day so they leave in the morning from their house they walk to these at least those many houses uh, but at times it is 60 houses then there are weeks special weeks when they cover up to 250 households in one week that is in six days um, and all of this is done by walking they do not get any support in terms of how to travel or any you know, vehicle. So they have to arrange on their own. Um, so they do all this uh, kind of work and, uh, and, uh, and in short, who they are, they are the women, people who 
the families first give a call to whenever they have a health problem. Uh, so right. they call them and then they have to figure out what to do about it, which actually means getting calls late at night. So it is a literally 24 hours job that these women do. So it is very important. So if, uh, when the countries talk about better maternal and child health care that have happened uh, across the world, they have played a very important role in reducing maternal mortality and in reducing infant mortality. So they are the ones who've done those things. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, can you quickly tell us about you know the challenges that they are facing in this work and uh, the demands that they have put forward in their charter? Right. Uh, so just to tell you about uh, the demands first, maybe, and then where it comes from, what they're asking is uh, there are uh, separate categories. If you look at the Charter of Demands, uh, and it is called the Charter of Demands of Community Health Workers in South Asia, uh, they are asking for uh, better wages uh, because uh, though the wages differ, uh, they are something like at times 2,500 rupees or in some states of India, say 9,000 rupees. They're paid really badly and uh, they are not considered one of the major demands is, and that is the slogan is community health work is work. They are not considered as workers. They are considered as volunteers. So you as if you're volunteering for all of this work. So you get uh, remuneration or just you are given basic minimum allowance. In Nepal, the allowance, is, uh, the only allowance they get is travel allowance, which is paid against some bills uh, and uh, uh, adherence allowance. There is no wage. There is no minimum wage. Uh, mm -hmm. That is so they are asking to be considered as government employees and at least the minimum wage to be paid to them, uh, and, but preferably uh, as much as government employees get paid and therefore the scale will come and they will their uh, wage will raise after every year, they will get promotions and all, all of that. Nothing of that sort happens. Once you join as an ASHA worker, you retire as an ASHA worker. Hmm. Talking about retirement, there are no uh, benefits after retirement they get. So uh, one of these women, they actually, they were telling us that they're, uh, I mean, she will retire after a couple of years and she's very tense because her friends who retired a few years ago, some of them are actually begging on the road. After doing so much of work uh, 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 for the society and for the government for 30 years, 35 years, they actually end up begging because they have they don't get any benefits or work as domestic help in uh, others' houses. So, so pension and social security is another demand. Basic health care is another demand. Um, and, uh, uh, and the wages, uh, as I said, and being recognized as proper workers. These are st fighting against stigma. Uh, there are a lot of cases of sexual harassment that they face because they're just entering into others' houses uh, and they, that is the part of their job. So th there has to be redressal. Um, these are some of the demands that they have and it comes from very um, I mean, experiences that they have. Uh, okay, and just lastly, infrastructure, because when they are actually in the community, they have no access to toilets, they are not provided water, there are no rooms where they can sit, so they do not know where to eat food. And these, uh, some of them don't end up eating. A lot of them actually face UTI, urinary tract in infection, because they don't drink water, because they do not have toilets to go to. Uh, and this is like very normal. And again, you hear them saying that, we talk to people about health, but our health we cannot take care of, and which creates a lot of stress to them because they know what it can do. Um, so, so yeah, so having toilets, room to sit, um, uh, water uh, to be provided uh, on a daily basis, these are, again, some of the very basic demands that they are asking for. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Josna, for talking to us about this very important story. Japan has announced that it will start releasing wastewater from the defunct Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant on Thursday, August 24th, despite stiff opposition both within and outside the country. The announcement was made by Prime Minister Fumio Kishida earlier this week. Even though Japan's discharge plans have been green-lighted by the International Atomic Energy Agency, calls for boycott of seafood and aquatic products from Japan have persisted. In a region already tense with recent geopolitical developments, what impact will the release of the wastewater have? We have with us Anish. So Anish, can you start off by giving us a bit of context? What is uh, this wastewater that is being discharged? You know, what is the science behind it? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we obviously all know about the, uh, the devastating earthquake and tsunami in, in 2011 that actually uh, caused 
a failure uh, at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And pretty much uh, this wastewater that we're talking about uh, is basically the water that was used to cool down the reactor while it was functioning. And so during the time uh, when it was it had to be, uh, you know, it, it has not been decommissioned yet, but the, when the plant went defunct, uh, these waters uh, had to be uh, stored. Uh, and uh, it's been more than a decade now. And uh, as per uh, the government's uh, statement and its uh, side of the argument, uh, if they have to decommission the plant completely, which is what their plan is, uh, they have to start discharging this wastewater. The, the argument that the government is giving, the Japanese government is giving, is that uh, the, plant, uh, the water has been uh, treated very well and has been diluted. So uh, the only radioactive uh, material that is found in the water, wastewater right now is tritium. And now the thing with tritium is that it cannot be, uh, like we do not have the technology to scientifically remove it uh, from, uh, uh, from any water body at the moment. So, the, but the thing is that you have to dilute it. That's the only other solution if your plan is to dump it into, uh, you know, uh, dump it into the ocean, essentially speaking. And uh, if that has to happen, uh, it has to be treated to a level that is far below uh, the current IAEA levels uh, of uh, wastewater discharges. And this is being done, like we have to also talk about the fact that this has been already being done in Europe and other parts of the world where nuclear wastewaters are discharged into the ocean. But the problem here is not so much about the science of the matter, because the IAEA report, which greenlighted the plan by Japan, actually did uh, only very specifically and narrowly spoke about the safety of whether the plan uh, uh, if the uh, the plan of discharging the water into the ocean is safe in the uh, or if it endangers local communities, the marine population, uh, and also you know other countries in the neighborhood, uh, and obviously that came out good for them. But when you look at it very narrowly in that respect, you do not really see other plans that are possible uh, that could have been done by the Japanese government. And obviously, the larger political uh, issue of uh, not consulting with anybody who is affected, including your neighborhood. Uh, and that is pretty much at the heart of the issue here. It is more about the lack of transparency. Like, we need to also talk about how this entire thing, like the announcement, which was a 48 hour announcement that we are, we are going to start discharging the water into the ocean without, like, obviously, people knew that they would start doing it uh, by this month. But nobody knew the date or the time uh, or even the amount. Now, uh, but the 48 hour notice kind of thing is something that obviously struck a lot of people. And we are already seeing protests, not just in uh, the neighborhood, uh, say China and South Korea, but also in Japan. Uh, and that clearly shows how uh, little the government has done to actually reach out to the people. So Anish, can you expand a little more on these concerns that are being raised, you know, both internally and externally uh, regarding the uh, discharge of this nuclear wastewater? Yes, yeah, so uh, like we need to begin with obviously what's happening within Japan. Uh, you have uh, the fishing community, uh, not just traditional ones also, like the, there is an entire community of fisher folk uh, on the east coast of Japan who uh, who fear, and very rightly so, that their uh, they, their livelihoods will be affected. And the, like the, there is obviously some level of alarmism regarding the wastewater per se, but it's not necessarily just the wastewater. The fact that your uh, you know your supply chains will be affected. Uh, there will be no demand for your products uh, once the waste uh, water starts reaching the ocean, and this is something that is going to affect livelihoods of hundreds of families across uh, East Coast, and that is some, and these were the people who were at the protest in Tokyo earlier today, and uh, this clearly shows that the government, uh, even though it's, uh, it gave a statement that it actually, uh, you know, engaged with people from the fishing industry, it was pretty much just talking about corporations uh, in the fishing industry and not necessarily communities and people who have been traditionally uh, part of the fishing community and the industry as well, and who also supply a good amount of, uh, you know, aquatic products, not just uh, for uh, primarily for the Japanese, but also for others as well. So uh, 
A, you have not consulted them. And this is similar to the concerns that have been raised by countries like China, countries like South Korea. Like, obviously, the South Korean government has uh, bent over backwards uh, in downplaying the concerns of its people. But, you know, the kind of protests that we're looking at in Seoul right now uh, and the amount of opposition in the country, it clearly shows there is a complete disconnect between the government and the people there. Uh, despite the outreach by the government talking about how safe it is, uh, uh, whatever the plan is, uh, the primary concerns of the fact that their concerns were never addressed. South Koreans were really not consulted. They were allowed to investigate and inspect the plan separately, but they were not really consulted on the matter. And this is something that China and China was completely left out. Hong Kong was completely left out. And so were Pacific uh, island nations uh, in you know the southern Pacific region, in the Australasia region. And that clearly also shows that there is uh, this sort of disconnect uh, between what has been planned and the fact that the government really is not transparent with this plan right now. What we know is the first phase of the plan. We do not know what will be happening for the next several years. The, uh, there are media reports saying that the discharge discharges can go on up for up to three decades even uh, if the amount of water being released is that small. So that clearly also shows that uh, the, this, uh, this sort of long-term plan is something that has been taken quite unilaterally by the Japanese government, by the Kishida government, and even its own people uh, were not consulted at this point in time. And we're also going to see that effect uh, because we are also looking at uh, import bans from uh, China, from Hong Kong, which pretty much together combined, uh, you know, uh, attracts about 40% of all Japanese aquatic exports. Uh, and that is going to hit their industries far worse than anybody else. And so this is something that Jap the Japanese government had to have you know taken far more seriously and it is not necessarily just the signs that we're talking about obviously the signs of discharging might be safe but there are also other concerns and uh, issues that were never addressed in throughout the entire process and that is primarily the reason why we are seeing such reaction to the res uh, to this announcement as well right thank you anish for talking to us and we'll be back to you in just a moment to discuss another story a big step forward for UPS workers in the United States as union members ratify historic agreement. On August 22nd, UPS workers organized by the International Brotherhood of Teamsters voted by an overwhelming majority of 86.3% to ratify a contract negotiated in July. This is the highest vote for a contract in the history of the union at UPS. The contract is the largest single employer contract in the country with UPS Teamsters representing 340,000 workers. The new contract enshrines several key victories achieved by the workers avoiding a looming strike. We now speak to Anish on the deal and the implications. So Anish, this victory by the UPS workers is the culmination of a long strike of months of organizing. Can you tell us what is in the new contract and how is it different from the previous contracts? Well, a big part of the contract is how uh, fair a deal it is going to present for UPS workers uh, compared to the 2018 uh, agreement, which was quite controversial even, the, even when it was passed. Uh, by a small majority, but still, uh, and that at the time, at the time, the leadership of Teamsters was widely criticized, including by its rank and file members, for allowing for such uh, a, a deal that uh, that would actually put workers behind in terms of uh, you know real wages uh, over the next several years. And obviously, they felt that cut very instantaneously. Uh, in a couple of years, we saw the pandemic. And uh, delivery workers were the first to be impacted throughout this entire, uh, you know, crisis, the global crisis that we saw at the time. And UPS workers were no different, obviously. And uh, we saw real wages being cut eventually because of the economic outcomes of the pandemic. And we saw uh, in several cases uh, about, uh, you know, wages, real wages being uh, going down by at least 10% in certain instances. So that clearly shows how behind workers were at the time when they were uh, when they actually passed the overwhelmingly passed the strike vote uh, earlier this year, and obviously that threatened uh, the entire industry as well. 
And so the current uh, deal uh, pretty much offers a massive increase from about $16 per hour on an average. Uh, workers can expect now about $21 per hour. And this is also going to show an other sort of benefit we are looking at uh, includes about $2.75 per hour uh, of a, 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 you know, a, a blank wage hike for everybody. Uh, at the moment that can actually, uh, you know, in, uh, give them, you know, some of the stolen wages uh, during the pandemic era. So this is a massive in improvement. And if you look at several other, uh, uh, you know, specifics of the agreement, we're looking at something like close to 70% uh, wage hike over the next uh, couple of years for these workers, which is way overdue considering A, the cost of living crisis that has that has impacted not just the U.S., but obviously everybody around the world, but specifically the U.S. during the pandemic. And uh, the rising prices, the inflation rates are not going down, have not really gone down to the extent that it should be. And that has obviously impacted your wages for, especially for uh, those who are making about close to around, uh, you know, minimum wages in the United States at the moment. And this includes obviously the U.S. workers. Of course, the UPS uh, mobilization is just one example. There have been many strikes by workers in different sectors in the United States in recent times. Even as we speak, workers in Hollywood are on strike. So what lessons can be drawn from the mobilization by the UPS workers? Well, uh, one of the things that is uh, the highlight of the current uh, victory is the fact that the new leadership which obviously uh, began because, uh, you know, came out of the discontentment uh, among the Teamsters Union after the 2018 fiasco, uh, really created a, a leadership that uh, was willing to fight and that and not just like come to a settlement uh, at the first drop of the hat. And that just uh, is the difference here. We are looking at unions, uh, union leaderships now who are more willing to fight uh, till the end and to see through their struggle and to make sure that their demands are met and rather than compromise with uh, employers. And that is something that uh, we saw, that is something that is quite clear, like the fact that the Teamsters Union and obviously UPS workers did not have to go through a strike uh, to make, uh, to have the demands met clearly shows that the willingness to struggle uh, made a big impact at the moment. And that is something that obviously you're seeing, obviously, with Hollywood workers, uh, writers and actors alike, uh, both of them uh, on an extended indefinite strike at the moment, uh, which is quite historic and hasn't happened for more than half a century now, uh, is something that is also seen that we're seeing with, you know, wider labor militancy across the United States. And this militancy, obviously, is a product of the crisis that has been impacted, uh, that has impacted workers uh, across sectors. And this is not just Hollywood or the delivery workers. We are seeing that with fast food chains, we're seeing that uh, with, uh, you know, retail workers and so on. And across the board, you're seeing either unionizing drives being, uh, you know, quite going, to, going on a massive speed. Obviously, Teamsters is one of them. When you look at, say, Amazon workers uh, unionizing or Starbucks workers unionizing, they're still part of that, uh, you know, significant process. But then there are also traditional trade unions who are, uh, you know, uh, upping the ante when it comes to, uh, you know, fighting for fair contracts for their, uh, for their members. And this is, uh, this is a very good time for uh, labor movements at the, uh, at the point. And this victory obviously will obviously boost and hopefully boost morale and, you know, boost the movement itself across sectors and across uh, trade unions. Thank you, Anish, for talking to us. And that's all for today. Thanks very much for watching Daily Debrief. Our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts have more of our stories. Our YouTube channel has more updates and this show. Remember to subscribe. Thanks again for watching.